interlocking areas here. And we'll just briefly run through these. This huge interest, for example, in the paranormal. The television is full of uh, programs about ghost hunters and all that sort of thing. So that's one part of it. There's also been a huge upsurge of interest in the last half century in what we would call um, ESP, extra sensory perception or the noetic sciences. And these include things like telepathy, telekinesis, moving objects by mind power, precognition, foretelling events before they happen, and other faculties as well. A lot of research has gone into this, but it's still marginalized and to some degree mocked by large sections of the scientific community. There's also, and this is controversial to some people, this huge interest in extraterrestrials of one side, one type or another, space beings from other worlds. And again, the television has lots and lots of programs, particularly focusing on ideas around the work of people like Eric von Denigen, who wrote this book more than 50 years ago called Chariot of the Gods, which basically argued that human beings had been seeded by beings from other worlds. And indeed, he has shown, and indeed other people have shown, that the cultures throughout the world talk about connections with faraway worlds. The Dogon people in West Africa, for example, talk about Sirius. And they knew that Sirius was a binary star, two stars together, long before modern astronomy had identified this only a few decades ago. Many cultures talk about star people, beings from elsewhere, coming to this earth to help improve our evolutionary prospects and to, and to give us tools and give us learning and knowledge about music and mathematics, weaving, construction, and all the other things we need to create a civilization. Um, so there is a huge amount of interest in all this at the moment. And of course, in theosophy, we talk a lot about uh, beings from other realms. We won't go into them in any great detail because I'm sure that you know you can read these things for yourself. But we talk, for example, about the Lords of the Flame from Venus who intervened in the early stages of the human project to try and bring a sense of mind and intellect to human beings because apparently we weren't doing all that well. Whether we're doing all that well now, I don't know. It's not really for me to say. But we also talk about the lunar and solar petries and the manasaputras and many other classes of entities who intervene. Many of these entities, of course, exist on realms other than the physical. So um, this afternoon, what I want to do is just briefly go through the kingdoms of nature as we understand them. So obviously we have the mineral kingdom and then the vegetable or plant kingdom, the animal kingdom and the human kingdom. But of course, there are others too. Below the mineral kingdom are said to be three elemental kingdoms. And these will feature quite prominently in our consideration of the nature spirits and indeed um, other entities a little bit later on. And then above the human kingdom is what we would call the kingdom of the devas, the angelic realms. Every culture recognizes this in some form and has its own hierarchies and beings in it. But this afternoon, I shall use the word angels and devas um, as meaning the same thing, a super human kingdom to which many of us will eventually gravitate possibly. Um, the two streams of evolution are separate, but there are connections between the Davic and the human kingdom. When I'm talking about elementals and nature spirits, I'll use these words interchangeably, meaning more or less the same things. When you read some of the accounts of this, people do conflate nature spirits and devas um, as the same thing. I'm putting them into two distinct categories, one from the three elemental kingdoms, the other from the angelic kingdom. So this is where we start. And 
for the vast majority of people, this hidden world, this hidden commonwealth of invisible non-human entities um, is, is just a myth. It's just part of legend. It's part of fairy tale. What they don't understand and what it's absolutely crucial to understand is that um, these life forms create, protect, and renew all the life forms in all those kingdoms of nature. They can be regarded as the builders, the workmen, the workwomen, the work entities. They do these things on that level. But they are guided by the higher Davic entities, the angels, and they can be regarded, as often said in theosophy, they can be regarded as the architects. They dream up schemes, they conceptualize it, and then the ele elementals actually get to work on all these things. Now, human history, until the modern industrial era, was replete with stories of people, most of whom at that time, in pre-industrial times, lived in the country, were more closely connected to nature, um, had a greater understanding of the earth and the seasons and the natural energies and all the other things which comprise nature. In every culture, on every continent, at every point through history, there has been an interaction and a knowledge of these elementals and they go by numerous different names in england we call them fairies goblins or many other different names indeed they are often very localized and uh, i have a book which runs to 500 pages and it lists just the fairy names for different parts of the uk in hindu mythology they talk about 330 million of these entities that's probably a symbolic figure, but they appear everywhere. And it's only in the modern world, for the last 250 years ago, as more and more people got decanted from the countryside into the towns and cities, that this has changed. And of course, industrialization has changed human mentality, it's changed the way we think into a, a mechanistic and very materialistic view of the world so that if we admit that we admit to the existence of other realms invisible realms beyond the capability of our five physical senses then people think either we're a bit crazy or naive or whatever but this isn't primitive superstition it features in all the legends and myths and folklore throughout history in every culture. But it's my strong assertion that all of these things are based upon reality. Our ancestors, you know, weren't fiction writers. Whatever they did, however symbolically they did it, it was based on real things. So when people talk about star people or fairies or goblins or whatever, they are referring to something that was part of their real experience. And people in the countryside knew that there were invisible entities which controlled the seasons, which controlled um, the climate and the rainfall and the sun. And they were dependent upon these entities in order to ensure successful crops or a successful hunt or whatever enterprise that they were engaged in. Um, but of course, in recent centuries, during this rise of industrialization, um, They've just been squeezed further and further from view. Um, and this has caused, I think, a real problem because it may be that these kingdoms that we don't even recognize, let alone cooperate with, they could be one of humanity's most vital allies to solve a lot of the problems that we clearly face on this planet at the moment. So let's go into a little bit more detail then. Let's um, have a look at the nature spirits themselves. Now, they're often described as being part of the four elements. So each class of them is linked to one of the different elements. Um, 
In England, we refer to this as the gnomes of the earth, the sylphs of the air, the undines of the water, and the salamanders of fire. This, of course, is our classification, and there are numerous other ways of looking at this. Um, so to repeat, throughout history, they've been recognized ubiquitously, um, you know, from fairies and elves in England, goblins, trolls, Scandinavia, leprechauns and little people of Ireland, or the good folk, the jinns of North Africa, these wispy figures that blow across the sand. Um, the Australian Aborigines have a name for them called Wangina, and the uh, Native American tribes such as the Zuni and the Cree describe them, as I mentioned earlier, as star people. So they kind of look on the elementals as something from the stars, which they may or may not be. Um, but now these are just seen as, you know, kind of fanciful uh, creation. And if you start telling people that there are fairies at the bottom of your garden or their garden, they probably will just think, you know, you've had too much Retsina to drink or something like that. But it's, uh, it's very interesting that when most of us now do live in towns and cities, in a very bustling environment, in a world that gets busier and busier and busier, we become more disconnected from the earth. We become more disconnected from ourselves and particularly from our inner selves. And so it makes any kind of perception of these uh, beings, these entities, even more difficult. Later on in the talk, we will approach some ways in which you know, it is possible to perceive them rather than seeing them with our physical eyes. Um, but people unconsciously do connect with both these classes of entities, the devas and the elementals. You know, why do people like to go to beaches so much? Well, is it just a suntan or drinking some cocktail or getting a, you know, swimming in the sea or whatever? That may be the case, but I think there's more to it than that because a beach, if you think about it, is where all the four elements meet and where there will be very strong presences of both nature spirits and devas who are particularly connected in some places with the sea. So this might be the reason that people, are, apart from the fact that it's a nice place to be, people are also drawn to mountaintops and to forests and woodlands or splendid gardens, all of which are places where there will be an abundance of nature spirits. They, of course, exist in towns and cities too, but the environment and people's mentality makes it even more difficult, I think, to uh, understand where they are. So there's another important factor um, to do with these elementals especially, well, particularly, um, and how they got banished from popular consciousness. Because from the Middle Ages onwards, the Catholic Church and its successors went to war against them. It demonized them, literally. It cynically transformed the elemental ki kingdoms into these demon realms which were controlled by Satan or Lucifer or the devil or whatever word they were using at the time. And they came to represent evil. Um, so the church declared that these denizens uh, were members of a, a wicked and forbidden kingdom with which it was impossible to commune in any way. And it condemned those who perceived these entities or who worked with them or communed with them as witches and sorcerers and necromancers and devil worshippers and dealt with them accordingly in the torture chambers or on the bonfires. So the church, of course, banished this part of the invisible kingdoms, but of course, it still believed, still does believe very much in the angelic presences. Okay, so let's have a look at what these elementals or nature spirits actually are. Um, 
They appear everywhere in Hindu, Greek, Chinese, Egyptian, Celtic, African, Native American cultures, especially. And there are literally millions of different names for them. As I said earlier on, some of them are just very localized names to one particular place, one particular wood, one particular village. Now, they have two forms, nature spirits and elementals. They have a permanent astral body. And they also have a temporarily materialized etheric body. It's said that they can change their shape and their size at will. And they are also very much affected by human thoughts and emotions. It's said many nature spirits are at best very suspicious of coarse human vibrations, but also are angry at the way that we have treated nature. Um, so they may be hostile to us for this reason. Uh, the sylphs of the air, for example, may be very disrupted by all the pollution that we put into it, as well as the electromagnetic radiation and the thermonuclear explosions that we've carried out, as well as things like germ warfare. Uh, the gnomes of the earth may resent mining activities and mineral extraction and oil drilling. Uh, it's quite interesting, actually, that there is a particular class of subterranean entity which miners all around the world in coal mines and metal mines report almost ubiquitously. Um, and then the undines and the other spirits of the, the rivers, the lakes, the oceans, etc., have also faced immense pollution. I read the other day, I think yesterday, that there are 133 trillion pieces of plastic littering this world. That's, well, if you divide that by the 8 billion people on Earth, that's an awful lot of plastic per head, isn't it? But this is not an environmental uh, uh, lecture anyway. Now, in many of the cultures, when I was studying this a couple of years ago, I read a lot about the um, English mythology and lots of stories about these elementals and nature spirits abducting people, especially children. And there are many stories of people uh, being lured on a country road late at night, a, a farmer after a few drinks by a, a pretty young woman with long flowing hair, and he's led into this fairy kingdom, usually in a, a fairy mound. And he stays there and has a good time with them for what he believes is one night. And he emerges later. And it's a year later or 10 years later or a century later. It's the Rip Van Winkle story, basically. So many of these stories associated with them, the good and the bad and the indifferent, do translate across the continents. And there are similarities uh, in all sorts of different uh, cultures. Um, but of course, the nature spirits don't just affect us as human beings. They also affect um, animals um, and they have an effect on the environment. You know, it's a pool or a lake and stones and in the mountains as well. Uh, but I think also in this modern world, there are people who speculate, and I'm not entirely sure if I go along with this, is that there are, there are a new class of machine entities which do things to cars and washing machines and especially to computers you know so when you get into that bad mood and you're trying to get online or you're trying to open that word document or do one of these many other things that the person my age doesn't even understand when it won't work there may be elementals at work but that entirely is speculation so We'll move on to the devas and the angels, which of course are a much more advanced evolutionary stream than the human. Uh, these are mentioned as nine classes of angels and archangels in Christian theology, seraphim, cherubim, thrones, dominions, virtues, powers, principalities, archangels and angels. That's a complete list. Uh, the Hebrews use the word the Elohim. Um, and of course, this word appears around two and a half thousand times in the, uh, the Hebrew sacred texts. Um, 
Angels also have their equivalent in virtually every other religion, including Hinduism. And they operate on a massive scale. So you will get devas working on a particular tree, for example, but then you will get ones that are interplanetary and cosmic even. So they range in scale from the very small to the gigantic and the indescribably um, enormous. So towns and cities will have their own presiding deva, and so do countries and planets and solar systems. And this work that they do continues invisibly and continuously. Um, and devas have an effect not just on the minds of individual people, but also on humanity's collective consciousness. Because whether we admit the fact or not, human consciousness is combined and it does form a collective body around the world, just the way the world has a, an astral body and an etheric body as well as a, a physical body. Um, so, as I say, instinctively, a lot of people are drawn to the kinds of places uh, where devas exist, often in nature, um, but possibly at sacred sites or places of earth energies, ley lines, um, wonderful archaeological structures of the past, or when they just walk through a wood in springtime and hear all those buzzing insects and smell the fragrance of the flowers. So they're in, in unconscious contact with these spirits, be they of the mountains or the lakes or wherever they happen to be. It might just be in your own back garden. Uh, so people enjoy this sort of thing, but they don't really know why. They don't understand the esoteric reasons why this stuff um, appeals to them. Let's just have a look briefly at the characteristics of the Davids. Well, they don't have solid physical bodies. They are more about knowing and being rather than doing. This is why we call them the architects. And our perception of them, when it does occur, tends to be intuitive rather than pictorial. By that, I mean, I know people have visions of angels and everything, but it's more likely that we will reach a connection with them on the mental levels because that's principally where they operate. They are non-human, although some are said by some writers to incarnate in, in human form, to be near those they love. And interestingly, certainly in Christian iconography, they're often pictured as having wings, as if they are flying creatures. Um, but these tend to be, I would have thought, more likely to be streaming emanations of energy of some kind rather than physical wings. But of course, these things become stylized and become physicalized over time in terms of people's perceptions, etc. cetera. Um, Davis, of course, not having physical bodies, don't die as such, um, but they do evolve as we do, and all the other kingdoms of nature do, um, progressively, and are, are given more and more important work to do. Davis are said to be the direct agents of the law of karma, the law of cause and effect. This is via um, a class called the Lipika, or the scribes, uh, the divine bureaucrats who record every single human thought and action um, in those indelible records. And it is said that the devas, the angels, do intervene uh, when humans cause changes which are incompatible with a particular cycle of existence. Uh, it could well be that there is an intimate connection between the Earth's various energy networks and the devic kingdoms. Um, they could be connected via what's said to be a global grid based around many of the sacred sites, Stonehenge, the pyramids, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's interesting, there is some film footage which exists of mysterious forces 
interfering with nuclear weapons tests, disabling or indeed the opposite, arming missiles. Um, and they're off certain presences are often seen around the places where these weapons are developed or stored. Some say that these are extraterrestrial interventions. So up to you to decide what they are, but there have been a number of well recorded instances where there have been these last minute interventions. So perhaps someone is looking out for us. Let's have a look at some of the different types of devas. Um, and this obviously depends to some extent on their function and location. So we'll find them in gardens, woodlands, hills, mountains, streams, rivers, waterfalls, lakes, and oceans. But we also see them in, in the clouds and in the weather patterns. Uh, they may be involved with natural phenomena such as earthquakes, volcanoes, and similar uh, geological events. They're attached to particular plants. Well, all plants have them, but a, one class of nature spirits or deva will preside over a particular class of plant. But they can also be found in places of healing, places of um, devotion or meditation, such as churches or temples, any place where some kind of sacred activity goes on. Um, even, I guess, you know, um, in the Theosophical Zoom meeting, uh, there may be uh, angelic presences uh, wafting over us this afternoon, um, providing they uh, understand Zoom. Um, so, as I said earlier on, there are devas of different villages and towns and cities. And the function of them there, function of the devas, is to ensure the inflow of a particular energy emanating from the sun, which we call prana, which is also sometimes known as chi. This is this vital energy which basically keeps us alive, and they help to step it down and distribute it in ways that I don't particularly understand. So they are conduits of this solar energy. Uh, it's said that every household has its own deva called the angel or the spirit of the hearth. Um, but you also find devas overshadowing places of government, um, of administration, um, law courts, uh, hospitals, that sort of thing. Um, and then, of course, on the much larger macro scale, there will be an archangel presiding over this planet, over the solar system, over the entire galaxy, probably. Um, so there is a world angel as well as national angels as well, be an angel of Britain, an angel of the United States, an angel of Zambia, et cetera, et cetera. It's also said that because they tend not to be seen and they tend to influence us by a process we might call overshadowing. This might go some way to explaining the synchronicity of research, which happens again and again and again. Two people, often in different locations, but sometimes living close by, come across the same uni unique idea at the same time. The classic example of this is Mr. Mercedes and Mr. Benz in Germany who are doing more or less the same kind of thing with the internal combustion engine unknown to each other, of course, until they, they met. So they may assist in all sorts of processes um, in introducing new ideas, social reforms, political, economic reforms, new forms of thinking, new philosophies, you name it. You know, they may have a role in that. Okay, so we are largely divorced from these kingdoms. Um, some religious people, Catholics and members of other faiths, will still have an abiding interest and belief in angels. But perhaps it's time that humanity as a whole started to have a closer relationship with these. Um, more than a century ago, 
um, one of the well-known second generation theosophists, Charles Leadbeater, suggested that one of the priorities of the new Aquarian age would be closer recognition, communication and cooperation with this kingdom of the Davids. He didn't say too much about the precise mechanics or the timetable for this, uh, but he also said that this would correspond with other key events on earth, new wisdom, new ideas emanating into human consciousness. Um, obviously, this is going to be very difficult when in our harsh world of materialistic logic, so few people um, don't believe in these entities in the first place. Um, and perhaps there is uh, a resentment at the way human beings have abused and done very unpleasant things to this planet. Uh, but perhaps this closer cooperation, if it can happen, and it's not going to happen on a mass scale, it's only going to happen amongst small groups of individuals initially, and it probably is happening right now. Um, but there may be assistance there to really help us solve our particular problems. Obviously, the the big human problem is, is human selfishness. And, and I guess the, the Davis can't uh, do much about that. That's a project we've got to work on by ourselves. But uh, if you're cautiously optimistic, we can hope that this selfishness does start to erode as people understand more and more about their essential spiritual rather than just physical um, identity. Um, Okay, so in the Theosophical Society over the years have been a few individuals who have had a much closer association with nature spirits and devas and who have claimed to be able to perceive them. In the Theosophical Society in England, there was a very well-known man called Geoffrey Hodson. And he wrote a number of very interesting books about this. They were all published in 1920s, but Geoffrey Hodson lived until he was nearly 100, and he wrote numerous articles about this as well. And he uh, started off, he came from Lancashire, and uh, he used to go out walking in the hills and fields and could see these things. And, and over his life, he got various artists to sketch what he saw and uh, he was quite prolific in what he did this he also worked with uh, a man called Edward Gardner who was another clairvoyant who used to live at uh, Teckles Park an estate which the uh, Theosophical Society used to own and interestingly both these individuals were involved in a, a notorious incident in 1917 the instance of the Cottingley fairies. Now I have a particular interest in this because I happen to grow up in a village two miles from where I now live called Cottingley. So I knew that village intimately and basically to cut a long story short, many of you will be familiar with it. Two schoolgirls um, borrowed a camera and took a number of pictures of what they claimed to be fairies in the local uh, woodland near where they lived, near a stream. And this excited a lot of interest. Uh, Arthur Conan Doyle wrote about it in the Strand magazine. Uh, it featured in the newspapers. There were a lot of skeptics. The film was tested and said to be authentic. And then the story goes quiet for a while. But basically, Hodson and Edward Gardner went up to Cottingley, and both of them claimed to be able to see um, the, the same spirits, the same fairies that the girls had claimed to see. Anyway, the story runs on into the 1980s and these girls are now both very old ladies and they admit that four out of the five pictures that they took were fakes and that the others were just cut out of a, a children's magazine and propped up against the trees. But they did insist that one of the pictures they took was genuine. And also, crucially, what they said was 
We only did this so that we could illustrate what we actually saw. So I'll leave you to draw your own conclusions about that. But Hodgson also did another very interesting piece of work. And, and you should read this because it's absolutely fascinating. It's too long to go into in any great detail here, but he wrote this book called The Miracle of Birth in 1929. And what he did, he followed a woman through all the stages of pregnancy and looked at what was happening clairvoyantly to the various bodies, the mental body, the astral body, the etheric body, and of course, the physical body growing inside uh, the mother. And he describes at different stages of the pregnancy how there is increased activity at certain points and some entities depart and other new ones appear on the scene. And towards the end of the pregnancy, there is a presiding deva who is organizing all the other elementals in growing the other bodies at the right way. And then towards the very end of it, um, Hodgson describes um, this incredible feminine presence. He calls her Our Lady. And it's a kind of personification of the feminine principle, which we elsewhere call Venus or Mary or Isis or Ishtar. And she presides over the birth of the child. There's another very interesting um, series of books by uh, a woman called Dora van Gelder. She was, uh, she grew up um, in a plantation um, in Jakarta in Indonesia. And from a very early age, she communed with all sorts of nature spirits in the various plantations and woodlands and jungles near where she lived. Eventually she moved to the United States and continued to have a very strong uh, presence with them. When she got to be about 80 or so, she wrote this incredible book about it. You can check it out on the, uh, uh, on the internet. So, as I say, there are a great many different types of um, these different entities. Uh, it might be interesting just to look at a couple of different ones. And uh, um, in Japan, the Shinto tradition um, is based on the worship of around 8 million spirit gods known as Kami. Um, kami itself means that which is hidden. Um, and these come in three separate classes. Um, first, the ancestors of the clan, second, the kami of creatures and objects, as well as the forces of nature, and the third, the souls of outstanding dead humans. And these were venerated from the earliest times, and they, <clears throat> I suppose, recommend, uh, represent the sacred or the mystical element of things, and they have the capacity for both good and evil. Um, sometimes they're said to be associated with illness or sudden death. But Kami also possess um, a life-giving and harmonizing power called Musubi, um, as well as a will, truth, and sincerity, which is known as Makoto. Um, but these Kami are not divine, they're not perfect, they're not omnipotent, and they're not inherently different to humans, but just a higher manifestation of life energy. So that's an interesting way that um, another culture looks on it. And it's very central to Japanese culture. I think there are 81,000 shrines devoted to these kami all over Japan. Um, in Ireland, there is a particularly interesting tradition going back a very, very long way to Neolithic times, possibly before of the Tawatha de Danon. Um, and these constitute a kind of supernatural pantheon from Irish mythology. And they appear also in different ways throughout the whole Celtic world or worlds because the Celts weren't just one homogenous people. And the Tuatha de Danann are said to be, again, sky or star people. Um, and the parents of the Celts, so again, we get this idea that we were seeded by those from elsewhere. Um, and although the Tuatha de Danann dwell in the other world, they closely interact with humans. Um, 
And each member of this group of entities has particular associations with different parts of life or nature. Um, interestingly, when Irish mythology was first recorded by early Christian monks, what they did was that they modified the narrative to some extent and transformed immortal gods into something more earthly, such as kings and queens or heroes of the remote past or sometimes they were depicted um, as just fallen angels. So um, time's running on. So I think we'll basically just wind up with a little bit about perception of both these classes of entities. As I say, as, although various clairvoyants um, have been and still claim to be able to perceive both these groups, it's most difficult for people without um, highly developed psychic faculties or other elevated states of consciousness. And of course, in the modern world, what we don't see, we don't believe, even though the human eye can only see you know, less than 1% of the electromagnetic spectrum, we still say seeing is believing. Um, but that's not to say that we can't perceive some of these entities. Um, as I've suggested already, people probably perceive them almost unconsciously without even knowing it, because to admit it would be to admit something which to them would be preposterous. So our lack of belief is also a barrier to be able to, be able to perceive them in the first place. Um, some people detect them through just that principle that we're all starting to develop as human beings, that sixth Theosophical principle, buddhi, or wisdom intuition, whereby we gain wisdom and knowledge and insights in a way that transcends the intellect. It goes beyond the intellect and it's not filtered by the mind. So, this is the way that I am able to perceive these things and other things through a process of intuition, which is something that. I'm very much trying to develop. Uh, but probably anyone who's drawn to the natural world is going to have some kind of connection with both these uh, groups of entities. Uh, sometimes people can hear the sounds of nature spirits on the sound of the waves on a beach or a tinkling stream or a waterfall or on a hot day in summer in a woodland where in amongst all the buzzing of the insects are other sounds as well, or in bird calls and, and various other ways. The sound of a, a wind high on a hill. Um, and these are basically musical indications of these things. These are just my particular views and the views of a few people that they wouldn't be the views of the vast majority of people. Um, but I think a lot of people like me are fairly sensitive, but not clairvoyant. Um, and we accept the fact that there are things in this world that we can't hear, taste, touch, or smell, or feel, or whatever. But we know that they're there nevertheless. Um, I have a small garden in my little cottage in Yorkshire, and it's not very large, but in the summer, you can definitely feel the presence of these things. Um, and also I have a cat who is somewhat sensitive as well. And she often looks at things happening in the garden or in this house, which I can't see. But otherwise, why would you spend two and a half minutes staring up into the corner of a room? So perhaps animals are able to have a relationship with these entities rather more than we do. Um, I think a lot of people now um, have a crude proto form of etheric vision. Etheric vision is something that we will uh, all develop again at some point in the future. We had it in the past, stored in the third eye and the pineal gland, which is now all closed up in the head, but it will reopen. And with some people, they are starting to be able to see etheric things. One way that I found that you can do this is if you um, 
managed to find one of those rare days in England when it's sunny and you have blue skies. Um, easier to do it in Greece. Uh, but if you have one of those days, if you stand with your back to the sun and you defocus your eyes on the blue clouds, you'll often see little wispy lines, um, gray, white, black, um, almost like cigarette smoke, wafting away and sometimes forming into different patterns. That is basically part of the etheric spectrum. That the etheric, of course, let's remind ourselves, solids, liquids, gases, possibly plasma, and then four etheric states of matter, making seven in all, subetheric, etheric, subatomic, and atomic. So probably what we can see is the lowest grade of these things. Um, but you have, to you have to not look at anything. You have to defocus your eyes in order to be able to uh, uh, do that. So just to conclude, um, I think that we ignore all these hidden realms and hidden dimensions and invisible entities and occult forces and energies that we don't understand. We ignore these things at our peril. Uh, and just because they're not widely recognized or understood doesn't mean that they can be ignored or marginalized into some primitive fantasy because they're far from that. Um, and science and some religions have frankly conspired to banish these invisible kingdoms. Uh, but ultimately the truth about these things will be known. I don't think that rediscovering these entities uh, will happen in the Christian churches and I don't think it'll happen in the scientists' laboratories. Um, I think this knowledge is held and imprisoned within us already. It just needs to be released in some way. Uh, and as always with these things, the truth needs to start not in the external world beyond ourselves, but within ourselves. Um, and yet to do that, I guess we need to release the mighty power of our imagination which is probably the most important tool that we as human beings have and use to learn, use it as a potent tool to learn and, and to free ourselves of all these preconceptions which stop us from opening ourselves up to other realities. And this has led to a kind of a spiritual imprisonment if not solitary confinement uh, for so long. And I've gone on for so long, I'll stop now. And thank you very much for listening. <laughs>